Sorry about that. My name is Ross Willits. I'm the uh, uh, co-chair of the Minnesota Citizens for the Arts Board. Uh, I'm welcoming you to this webinar where we're going to be looking at uh, audience surveys that uh, Wolf Brown has been conducting over the past year around attitudes returning, uh, audience attitudes returning to um, to events around the state. And a number of organizations around Minnesota have been part of a, a couple of different cohorts that, uh, that Wolf Brown has been aggregating data from. And um, I'll let Alan tell you all about it. It's been an exciting and interesting project that's been going on for about uh, nine months. So Alan, I will hand it over to you, Alan. Thank you, Ross for that and welcome everyone. Greetings from the Motor City of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I'm so happy to have your um, participation in this uh, briefing on results from the Audience Outlook Monitor study. I'll give you background on the study and uh, take you through sort of very top level results and uh, that will touch on sort of key indicators of audience demand. Uh, a few findings related to demand for digital content, I know is a topic on everyone's mind. And then I'll wrap up by focusing in on attitudes about vaccination, uh, likely uptake on vaccination, and then uh, end with a provocation for you about sort of what we can do as a sector to support the public health work. Um, but I just want to start by um, just a quick, quick introduction. I want to apologize in advance if you hear a bark or two. Uh, I have three large dogs at my feet um, and they're named after opera characters uh, from Amal and the Night Visitors. My dogs are Casper, Melchior, and Balthazar. So if you hear them, I apologize, um, but it's that time of day when things happen outside and I unfortunately can't leave them elsewhere. Anyway, um, I am a musician. I'm a trained classical uh, singer, actually. I started life as a music major at the University of Michigan. Um, I was born in Minneapolis. Uh, my family lived there. My older brother, you, some of you may know, is Chris Brown, a bass player in the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. Um, so I have uh, roots in, in Minneapolis and Minnesota in general and a great fondness there. So I was really thrilled we were able to have a cohort from uh, Minnesota. Um, so that being said, I'm gonna just jump right in now and run through some, uh, some highlights. And I just wanna ask Ross, feel free to interject at any point, come back in, interrupt me with a question or a clarification. Um, so let's, let's keep this as informal as possible. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and especially if any of you have questions as we go along, please use the chat or the Q and A um, panel in Zoom. Uh, so the study, uh, came about really way back in March of last year when things were closing down and um, everyone was in cancellation mode and layoff mode. And it really, it dawned on me that, that we would need to, some mechanism for hearing from audiences about how they feel about coming back to live programs. And so the, the sort of the germ of the idea um, was to just set up this sort of tracking mechanism. And so uh, we organized the study in cohorts so that multiple organizations in different regions, cities and regions could participate. So you can see here the list of cohorts, uh, the regional cohorts, which uh, includes the um, Minnesota cohort, and uh, other, we had some disciplinary cohorts. There are several organizations in Minnesota that are participating in other cohorts. I'll, I'll show you that next. Uh, but I do wanna just know we did have participation outside of the US. Our survey was deployed nationally in Australia with support from the Australia Council for the Arts. Also, we were uh, province-wide uh, survey of arts organizations in Ontario. 
as well as a cohort of Canadian theaters, as well as nationwide in Norway. Uh, it was just helpful to, to have uh, data points from other countries who were, who were at least in very different places with COVID um, and still are to some extent. Uh, so the cohort in, in Minnesota, uh, I was so happy to have two choral arts organizations and I wanna send out a special thanks to the folks at Vocal Essence who were really instrumental in helping this cohort come together um, and, and really advocating for a local cohort. Um, <clears throat> the Ordway Center is participating in another, in, in the cohort of uh, National Cohort of Performing Arts Centers um, and they allowed their data to come into the Minnesota dashboard so, so everyone could share that. Um, and also um, Northrop at University of Minnesota was part, is participating in a cohort of uh, university presenters. And they similarly um, allowed their data to come into the uh, Minneapolis cohort. So. Um, I was so thrilled to have a couple of presenters from outlying areas. Uh, our data is very heavily biased towards big cities. So it was especially helpful to, to have that. So the study methodology was, was really super simple, which was that all of the 575 arts organizations participating in the study sent out emails to their patrons to their ticket buyers or visitors or members as the case with museums and, uh, and just ask them to cooperate with the survey um, and then send a reminder message. And we just asked people to um, divide up their lists so that no one got asked more than once to take the survey. And in most cities, we deduped the lists so that no one was asked more by more than one organization. Um, we were not able to do that in Minneapolis, so some people might have gotten asked more than once to take the survey. Um, but the survey was deployed five times in Minnesota, and in, you'll see in other cohorts, um, each cohort uh, deployed the survey either monthly or bi-monthly, so every other month. But in some cases, we had people deploying the survey every two weeks. So, um, so over the course of eight months, um, we have amazing time series data. So we're asking the same questions of randomized samples and we're getting really, a, you know, by the end of this pretty amazing time series data and lots of it. So I'll be showing you results from uh, a range of cohorts, not just the Minnesota cohorts, but also um, the big picture. So the protocol itself, you know, back in, in March, you know, I know, I knew that we needed time series data, but of course I had no idea what questions we'd need to be asking of audiences come summer or fall. So the whole point of the, of the project was to allow for the protocol itself to evolve. Um, and so there was an initial focus on uh, health safety uh, measures, uh, in venues, like how, how could we make venues safe? Would people comply? What was important to them? That was sort of before we were even talking about distancing as a thing. Uh, and then of course, digital programming became a huge priority. So we pivoted because we weren't really seeing a lot of movement in indicators of demand in the summer and fall months. We pivoted a big time to digital. So I'll share with you some of those results. And then obviously as the vaccine came into the picture uh, later in the fall, uh, we uh, began exploring questioning around vaccination. Um, and, and I'll share that with you as well. So, um, so let's just delve in. The first thing I want to share with you is, um, is this question, this contextual information. We asked people sort of several questions about what's your experience with COVID. And we asked people specifically if, if, if anyone in, in your household is vulnerable to a serious health outcome if they catch the virus. And you can see here that 50% of, 
of our respondents almost across every cohort said, yes, I have a serious, I have a vulnerability to a serious health outcome. And what you're looking at here is, is sort of the best sample that we have, which is the data from the National Performing Arts Center sample. They were deploying every two weeks, then every three weeks. Um, so we have great time series data from May stretching to January 13th and even more recent than that. Um, but this has remained remarkably consistent in terms of people understanding their vulnerability to a serious health outcome. And this is important because it drives so much else. It drives people's level of caution, their reservations about going out again, their overall readiness to return um, hinges a great deal on their belief that they are vulnerable to a serious health outcome. Um, we also started asking in um, August uh, people's perceptions of conditions as, um, as worsening or improving as regards the infection rates. Um, and so you can see here, um, this again is the National Performing Arts Center sample, um, the, the story of, of COVID really um, for the last eight months, which is things were improving greatly back in August into September and then uh, things tanked. Um, and in November, December, right, you know, right around the election and afterwards, uh, we kind of bottomed out uh, nationally with the big surge that we're still coming out of. Um, and you can see I've added here data from just two weeks ago, February 3rd. Um, so you're really seeing very recent data and you see the dramatic turnaround in perceptions of conditions as improving. Um, we still have, you know, this is again a national sample. Um, unfortunately, I don't have recent data from Minnesota here, but, um, you know, more people than not believe things are getting better or, or, or holding steady um, and few, fewer people believe things are getting worse, which is great. However, that sort of understanding that things conditions are improving has not yet translated into increased comfort level going out. So the question here is how comfortable would you feel uh, doing the fo following types of indoor um, the cultural facilities. So this, the data you're looking at is uh, for um, attend a large theater or concert hall. And you see um, that just things just never moved really from May onwards, we had a little improvement in the summer months, um, but uh, there, things are just sitting right between not comfortable and somewhat comfortable. But again, this is for attending a large theater or concert hall. Um, there were some regional variations that were a little interesting. Um, Minnesota was a little ahead of some other cities here. Um, Australia, of course, was far better back in September. Um, we, we have a great partner in Australia who's, who's um, you know, they're, they are now um, having some days at a time with no COVID cases, no new COVID cases, but when they find a COVID case, they lock down the whole city. Uh, that's really effective, at least now, but in the long run, um, maybe not so effective um, if that leads to kind of rolling lockdowns for years. Um, but um, what we just compare this to is the figures for museums. So people are much more comfortable walking around a museum or gallery uh, than they are going to an indoor theater. And of course we've known this um, and you see the figure. I mean, still not very comfortable, somewhat comfortable. Minnesota here was right on, on par with some other cities here. Of course, Australia was much higher, but generally, you know, people were much more comfortable in spaces where they could control their proximity to other people and, and just feel like they have um, uh, more options um, and, and, and are moving uh, as opposed to seated. 
for prolonged periods of time. Um, we also saw a um, bit higher comfort level with smaller uh, venues, seating smaller numbers of people, um, which, which of course is intuitive. Um, and, uh, but still overall, people are still below somewhat comfortable at all of these sizes. <clears throat> so, um, and the figures in Australia actually were more pronounced in terms of the gap between feeling safe in smaller spaces. Um, so we, we, I won't show it, but we also learned about a higher level of comfort for outdoor facilities with the Lord's ventilation system. Uh, but this chart here really tells the big story of the whole first phase of, of research. Uh, and the question here is under what conditions will you return? And the answer items at the bottom, the yellow bars here show um, the percentages of people who say I'm ready to go out now. Um, and that this is the Performing Arts Center sample running right up till February 3rd. And there was a, an increase in the percentages of people who said they're ready to go out now. And that dropped a little bit and has recovered a little bit. But basically what you've seen is, is the middle answer items, you know, that I'll be ready to go out when infection rates drop to zero, that people are figured out that's never going to happen on its own without a vaccine. So more people are saying I'm waiting to get vaccinated and, and it's actually concerning this recent um, phenomenon where more people are saying I'm not going out in the foreseeable future. Uh, that is a small but now growing percentage up to 13% uh, two weeks ago of people saying not anytime in the foreseeable future. I don't, I don't really know why, um, but we're, we're, we, you know, we've always known throughout this phase of research that there's some people who really won't be going out again until there is no risk to them. And of course that's very problematic because there's almost some risk in every scenario that we can offer them. Um, I'm, I'm beginning to think that maybe if there is an antibody test or an immunity test that people can take after they're vaccinated to verify that they are immune, that might cross the threshold for, for these most risk averse people, but I'm not sure yet. And I don't believe that test exists yet. Um, so you get the overall pattern of caution some people were ready to go out right away with or without a vaccine, but most people are waiting for a vaccine um, or, or having other reservations. So this is a picture, this is the same data for Minnesota. These were the five deployments in Minnesota. Um, and you saw just a pretty steady, uh, steady finding of people waiting for vaccination, similar to the story you say. Fewer, relatively fewer people in Minnesota saying they're ready to go out right away. Um, we did see interesting regional variations, higher percentages of people ready to go out right away in Tennessee, Kentucky, Florida, Texas. You get the picture. Lower percentages in New York, California, and other coastal states. You get the picture. Um, on a positive note, uh, we're asking people uh, after you feel comfortable going out again, you think your spending will be as much or higher or lower than before. And 90 plus percent of people say my spending will be the same as it was or more. And there's a curious uptick uh, back in December of, of percentages when the percentages went up from 14% to 22% of people who actually said, I'll be spending more. Um, so in the next version of the survey, we're asking a follow-up question of those people and just trying to see what explains their intention to actually um, engage even more deeply in, in culture. Um, as well as we're following up with people who say they'll be going out less frequently and, and asking why. Um, so uh, let's um, 
move on to some findings around digital content. Um, and again, I just at this pause, I want to ask you to um, feel free to, to um, ask me questions. Uh, I will, um, after the digital, after the next segment, I'll pause and, and see if we have any questions before, before moving on. But we should have a good, a good sort of 15 minutes or at the end for, for Q&A. Okay, um, you know, who's looking for digital content? Um, you know, and I just want to say that all the questioning we've done around demand for digital content, which has been quite extensive, has proven, if anything, how much people value live programs. Um, we've just, we've had a number of open-ended questions around digital and there's a lot of interest in digital content, but people just overwhelmingly felt strongly about the, the importance of live and that really the digital will never replace live and, and people really, really get that. And so it's been very validating in a way, all the questioning around digital, how, how much people voice um, this, this deep, deep affection for the live experience. Um, but here you see, um, these are six different cohorts, including Minnesota, 20% roughly say, I'm, I'm really actively looking for digital content. 60% say I'm selective, which could mean they're skeptical, very infrequent watchers of digital content, or it could just mean they're very choosy, but enthusiastic, that's a big middle. And then 20% up to 25 or as much as 30% are just saying really, actually, I'm not interested at all in digital content. Um, so I just a reminder here that we're surveying ticket buyers and, and there's likely a loyalty bias in the respondent pool. So we're hearing from our most loyal ticket buyers and, and, and that is, you know, we have some responses from less loyal buyers. Um, so we just wanna bear in mind who we're surveying here and, uh, uh, and that there's a skew towards loyalty, which for performing arts would be subscribers and probably a slightly older demographic. Um, but uh, if you include this, the, the people in the middle, there's a huge, huge marketplace for digital here. Um, and we're trying to figure out like who's attracted to digital content. And honestly, it's um, people who are vulnerable to a serious health outcome actually are significantly more actively choosing digital, um, which makes sense. They, they can't go out. They're very concerned about going out and they realize that might last a long time. And so they're engaging digitally, which, which is amazing and, and is a credit to all of you who are working so hard to offer digital programs. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, it's not everyone. The, the numbers are range wildly for organization to organization. You know, early on in the pandemic, I think the highest figures we saw for any organization across all of our cohorts was a small improv uh, theater company in Atlanta. And they had just huge percentages of their patrons watching because they were doing daily improv live streams. Um, so it varies so much from organization to organization, but generally this is, this is a big takeaway for me is that the people who are most cautious about going out again are most interested in digital content. And as we are able to reopen, it will only be natural for us to celebrate the people who are willing to come out right away, but let's not forget the people who are not ready to go out and won't be for a while. Uh, because they are some of our most loyal and dedicated folks. Uh, and we will need to continue to find a way to be relevant to them uh, without live events in the picture for them. 
Uh, I just wanted to share that this is data from the Philadelphia Orchestra used with permission. Um, they have been very active in producing digital programs. Um, their digital stage is wonderful. They sell $15 tickets, uh, buys you access to a concert. You have, I think, a week to watch it. So it's a nice pay-per-view model. And, and this is a survey of their patrons and lo and behold, 40% of, you know, this is a, by the way, this is a different question than the graphs we were just looking at. This question asked people in the last two weeks, what was your engagement with digital programming? And essentially, did you pay or did you watch for free or did you not watch? And so for Philadelphia Orchestra, the figures, you know, there, there, there was a higher trend when they implemented their digital programming and their folks are, are paying for digital content at a pretty high rate. Um, and just compare that to the Nashville Symphony uh, who who've been, uh, they were very cautious early on. They actually furloughed the whole orchestra. They've slowly began um, bringing people back on, but they were not as active in the digital space. And that's just reflected in their data. So back to Philadelphia and Nashville, and you just see um, you know, one of the axioms of, of arts participation is that supply stimulates demand. You know, they're, they're, we through creative programming actually can catalyze demand where there wasn't any. And I think that's, uh, that's part, part of what's happening here. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, this is the picture of, of six different cohorts, including Minnesota. Um, and uh, in Minnesota, we had 22% paying for digital content in the last two weeks and another 40% watching for free. Um, so again, I'm taking away, this is very much an emerging market. People are being exposed to digital content. They're learning what the possibilities are. They're maybe wrangling their home AV resources, figuring out how to set it up, how to get through the paywalls. If, you know, This is very much an emerging market. People are seeing stuff, they're figuring out what they like, what they don't like. Um, and there's a, even within the audience, there's a pretty significant market for digital content. And of course, we're not surveying people who are not in the audience. So this study does not speak to the larger uh, landscape of demand. Um, I know anecdotally from some of the orchestras and others that we're working with that they're seeing 20% or 30% of, of people who are buying digital are from out of the area. So we know that digital is reaching people who would never be able to come to live programs. And of course, that's a wonderful opportunity if it can be sustained. Um, little deep dive on, on how did you pay? Um, most people are just having a pay per view or also it's quite prevalent of a voluntary donation module uh, um, approach to pricing. And I, I can't tell you which is more productive from a pricing standpoint. I think some of your cohort members have experience with this and maybe you do. Um, I think the voluntary donation route can be quite financially productive. Um, more organizations are now going to a subscription model um, or tying access to digital content to um, a gift of a, a financial contribution. Um, so there's just so many questions we have around whole digital. I mean, we really need to do a major international study just on digital because it's such a complex area. Um, we did this little deep dive. This was a bit of, uh, of an interest of mine of sort of the whole setup at home. Um, and, you know, if we're really claiming that we can accomplish our missions through digital content, then we actually need to care how that content is received technologically at home. So we ask people, all sorts of questions about, do you pay attention? 
Um, do you give digital programming your full attention or your partial attention, or does it depend? And what does it depend on? And we have really great data on that. And this is, of course, slightly shocking that half of the people say they're paying full attention. Um, I, this is one of my favorite cross tabs. It's older folks who are better at paying attention. Um, this is Minnesota data. It's a little thin. Um, I've seen this even stronger relationship in other cohorts. Um, but younger folks, more accustomed to multitasking, perhaps. But I think it goes even deeper than that. Um, we ask people specifically, what equipment are you using for digital? What is your visual experience and how is that matched with an audio experience? Um, and we see here, um, first of all, younger folks are just using more different technologies, especially more mobile devices. Um, but still the dominant setup is watching digital content on a computer using the computer's audio. Um, and I don't know about your laptop, but um, you know, I would argue with an orchestra that you really cannot accomplish your mission if I'm listening to your music on a MacBook uh, or a, another laptop with old, you know, little internal speakers. Um, the second modality of setup that's dominant is getting your butt in the living room and watching television. Um, and in many cases, um, uh, connecting to an external audio system. So, you know, really these are two very different paradigms, very different setups. You know, sitting at a desk in front of a computer where you normally work and sitting in, you know, in the theater of your living room where you normally watch movies um, is just such a different setup. And I... Um, <laughs> Melchior. One moment. Hey, come here. Hey. While Alan is dealing with his dog, I am so uh, sorry. Uh, please remember you can put questions in the in the chat and the Q and A, and we'll get to them as soon as Alan's finished with this part of the uh, thing. I'm so sorry about that. Balthazar um, is allowed now. Um, um, so I don't want to make too much of this, but I do think like if we're really moving into the digital space in the long run and, and really staking our missions on this, we have to realize that we're, we're establishing new norms um, of, be, of behavior for, for watching and engaging with digital content. And I think we need to kind of try to steer people into the living room, into that higher quality uh, listening environment. Uh, and then we asked folks, you know, do you need help with your at home setup? And uh, I love this that, you know, older folks were more likely to say, yes, uh, I need a better setup. Um, I, I don't know if those of you who are old enough to remember when DVDs came out and everyone started buying surround sound systems with their TVs and, you know, to get the most out of DVDs. And I kind of think we're kind of in a, in another moment where, where people are kind of realizing that they need to upgrade their, their home AV setup. Okay, um, let's move on to vaccination questions. Um, uh, Alan, can oh, I? Sorry, ask? yeah, I was going to pause. Ross, go ahead. I, I have a couple of questions on um, on digital, and I've got another question that goes back to uh, okay. some other things. But I'll hold that one for a little later. The two questions on on digital are kind of uh, related here. First is from Nina Graham. Did you look at how much people are paying per digital experience? And from Latia Childers. When we go back to in-person viewing, will digital tickets be the same price or different? <laughs> yeah, um, great questions. Um, it's notoriously difficult to research pricing uh, because people will never say in a survey what they'll really pay. <laughs> um, 
we nevertheless we we attempted that very question um and i and we we asked what would you pay for a live stream versus uh what would you pay for a produced recording of a live performance and on you know the the mode was twenty dollars somewhere between 20 and 25 dollars um philadelphia orchestra charges 15 um you know i i think we have just a lot of testing to do to kind of find that price point and, and i think it depends entirely on what what the offer is so a live stream a true live stream where there's like stationary cameras and it's a contemporaneous broadcast you know depending on what your art form is you know a lot there there does appear to be demand for true live streams which which actually surprised me um and we asked people like what can you get from a live stream that you cannot get from a recording of the same performance and people were quite articulate that with a live stream it gets on my calendar if i don't make it i'll miss it it's live, anything could happen. I like that it's live, that has meaning and value to people. So I think there's a product amongst the portfolio of, of digital products that is just the raw live stream. Um, and I, I think that's probably a lower cost, a lower price, because I really see it as an entry point, a trial you know, to try to welcome more people into the family. Um, produced videos are much more costly. I think they're gonna probably cost more. As to the second question, you know, what I don't know, but I kind of think the cost of, of a digital ticket would be like a bad balcony seat. <laughs> so it would be kind of at the lower end of your array of pricing um but that's just a hunch that's not based on on any research at all but i think we need to solve that on a metaphorical level so that people say oh well the digital price you know i can i could pay the same amount and get into the live in but but not as much as a premium premium seat which would be a different experience anyway that's that's my answer ross for the those two Thank okay. you. I, I have I have one other uh, digital question uh, from the Paradise Center. What is the best way to encourage people to watch on their smart TV rather than their computer? Yeah. Oh boy. Um, I think we have a lot of coaching to do. Of um, I think. Um, a lot of people don't quite know how to connect their TV to the internet. Uh, and so finding um, instructional vi videos um, or making your own, su suggesting to people what the optimal setup is, even having a help desk. Uh, I've been trying to convince the Cleveland Orchestra to get into the business of sending people, sending audio technicians out to people's homes to upgrade their equipment for a fee. Uh, the audio rescue team. Um, uh, so I, you know, I think we just have a lot of co coaching to do. And uh, I know like Cleveland in their online gift shop is offering a Bluetooth enabled speaker that they're kind of recommending for people. So coaching, I guess. Thank you for the question. Great, why, right. don't you, uh, why don't you move on to your vaccination okay. section? Okay, thanks Ross. Um, so uh, vaccination of course came on the radar map uh, really kind of in October when we had news that there would be vaccines and I just start with the national figures here uh, from the Pew Research Center. Of course, they repeated their study three times last year. Um, quite different results. Initially, the 
percentage of people who said they'd get vaccinated was at 72, then it went down to 51%, then it went back up to 60%. I've seen other studies uh, place that figure now back up around 70% of American adults saying they will get vaccinated, either definitely or probably. And so let's just say for the sake of argument that we're at 30% of adults now saying they will probably not get vaccinated or definitely not get vaccinated. And you know what Mr. Fauci has been saying about herd immunity happens. I don't know what the current range is now, Ross, 70% um, to 85%. You know, I've, I've heard it's kind of in there. It, it's been a moving target and maybe it still is, but my point is that we're, you know, that's a high number uh, and we have a lot of work to do in the general population around um, public health and advocating for vaccination. Actually, our whole sector depends on but we'll come back to that. The good news is for us, very low percentages of, of our folks are saying they won't get vaccinated. Uh, it's as low as 2% in New York and, and of the five cohorts in this graph, the highest figure is for Minnesota at 8%. Now that's not to say that everyone is running out and getting vaccinated, but the figures actually for this have moved dramatically in the last two months. So this is the sort of full picture for again, five different cohorts, Minnesota being the fourth column in this chart. And we have about half of everyone saying I'll get vaccinated either right away or as soon as my doctor recommends it, but this data for Minnesota dates back to November 15th, which is like eons ago um, in the world, in the vaccine. This was like before the rollout of the vaccine. Um, but note that the second column in this chart is for the New York cohort. It's a group cohort of off-Broadway theaters and this dates to January 14th and look at the difference. Um, and in fact, um, this is data from the Cleveland Orchestra um, and they asked this question six times and look at the movement. So, you know, we've really seen a dramatic change in attitudes, even within the arts audience. You know, back in September, there were problems with between Trump and the CDC and the, F, you know, the vaccine, there were a lot, there was a lot of concern that vaccines were being brought to market too quickly when with political interference and it was not good. And that has dramatically turned around so that we're really now, at least in Cleveland here, it's 65% of people saying right away and another 14 saying as soon as my doctor recommends it. So we're really up to 80% of people saying more or less, give me the vaccine as quickly as you can. So some people are still waiting, I'm just super cautious, wanting to make see how it goes, making double sure there are no side effects but we've really seen a remarkable shift. And we have seen some uh, evidence of hesitancy within our data set uh, amongst African-Americans. This chart is from the, from the National Performing Arts Center cohort, and it shows uh, plans for vaccination by racial group. And we just see much lower uh, uh, levels of interest getting vaccinated amongst African-Americans who are a very small percent of the sample, but large enough to, to be able to report on confidently. Um, so even within arts audiences, we have ch challenges um, in terms of um, a, a allowing for dialogue about um, uh, health concerns. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that again in a second. And then we have also this, um, this sort of riddle 
Um, there, there is an element uh, uh, within the arts audience of people who do not want to get vaccinated. Uh, it's, it's small, as we just saw. There are regional variations, um, but almost all of those people are say that they're ready to go out right away, which makes sense intuitively, right? Um, but that's also the dilemma is the, the minute you open your doors, the first people in the doors are the people who don't wanna get vaccinated. And I know right now there are a lot of discussions about mandatory um, attendance, sorry, limiting attendance to only to people who are vaccinated. I've heard anecdotally that insurers are asking arts organizations to only allow vaccinated people in um, I think that's a very slippery slope. Our, our you know, commercial sector folks maybe can, can do that. Um, but I fear for a variety of reasons that um, excluding people who won't get vaccinated will become um, um, uh, evidence of, of racism uh, and will bring us right back to where we were uh, last summer. So we have a lot of moral and legal issues to wade through in that respect. Also, yeah. Um, so um, one more chart here before I kind of summarize, um, which is what we're beginning to focus on now is post-vaccination hesitancy to go out again. Um, here you see we're asking people after they've been vaccinated when they will be ready to go out. And the yellow bars are people basically say, as soon as I'm immune, I'm ready to go. So resumption of demand is gonna happen incrementally. There are people who are ready to go out now. Some of them are not gonna get vaccinated. Some, most of them are. Um, those who get vaccinated right away, some of them will be ready to go out right away as soon as it's permitted. Some of them won't, many of them won't. Um, we're gonna be in this awkward place for months where some people within a household are vaccinated while others aren't, or people within the same social circle who go out together, some are vaccinated, others aren't. That will slowly clear itself up over time as more people get vaccinated. And um, we're just gonna be in this waiting game with people after they get vaccinated as to when they're ready to go out again. Obviously they're waiting for infection rates to go way down. So, so really, you know, it's fantastic to say that 95% of audiences will get vaccinated. And, and you know, I honestly think as we move through the next phase of research, we're gonna need to reflect that progress with vaccination back to our audiences. And, and members um, to build confidence that we're on track to achieve a very high percentage of vaccination, at least within the audience, you know, and how appealing it is to think that it would be safer to go to the theater than to go to the grocery store. Um, but that's of course, not the only factor driving. And of course, general population uptake on the vaccine is what we all need to focus on. So we're on this off-ramp from COVID, thank God. Um, but it's a slow road. Uh, people will gradually emerge into the marketplace. And then we're educating, we're communicating with them about what the experience will be like. I, you know, I think we all have to think about transitional strategies where we're partially open and where some people will come back, but some people won't. Uh, and we're gonna be in that sort of interstitial space for quite some time. Um, uh, I think it's very problematic for, for the large venues who can economically really only operate at 100% capacity. Um, I, I just think it's gonna be a long time before that happens. Um, but the faster we get down this, this roadway, this off-ramp, depends entirely on success in the general population with vaccination. And I just encourage all of you 
to consider what you can contribute with your unique artistic assets and facilities and communication resources, what you can contribute to the public health effort. Um, because we need to be right now, our whole sector, the future of our sector hinges on success with the public health effort right now. Um, and if we don't reach herd immunity, uh, we're gonna have outbreaks of COVID on an ongoing basis, rolling lockdowns for years, and, and many, many of us will go out of business. So I honestly believe the place we need to be right now is in partnership with public health, doing wonderful artistic programs, um, everything from um, uh, ther music therapy for people who've had COVID to entertaining people while they stand in line to get vaccinated to um, serious theatrical work about um, health and risk. Uh, because really, this is all about really, we've been reminded uh, about our mortality. Um, and there's just, I think, a rich territory of artistic work that we can bring forward that would help our communities talk about choices and, and um, how our decisions affect others. And that's the conversation I think we need to be in right now. Um, and I know that's tough um, with so many people laid off. Uh, we don't have our full battalion of staff and resources, but honestly, right now is where I think we need to be so that we can all play the role of Elvis Presley here and get our, you know, play our role in, uh, in the public health effort. Um, so Ross, that's, uh, that's pretty much everything I have. Um, I'll, I'll just say that um, we are kind of relaunching the whole study. We have already, uh, some cohorts will continue, uh, others will not. Um, we're planning on going all the way through this year We've refined the survey. I will keep recording uh, briefings. Uh, you can find them at the audienceoutlookmonitor.com website. Um, we'll continue to ask questions about vaccination and especially people who have not yet been vaccinated, what their plans are. So we can really chart progress step-by-step, step, month after month um, to really fuel the communications work of arts organizations in building confidence that we will again uh, have live events. Um, so with that, I'll um, I'll stop Ross. I'll uh, stop my share and just come back on video. And we got about five minutes for any further questions. Great, thank you, Alan. This is such wonderful information and and. Um, I've got I've got a couple of questions that we'll get to in the in the time that we've got. Um, first, uh, were there questions about the conditions at the venue that would affect respondents' comfort level in returning, mask wearing, yeah. reducing audience, et cetera, uh, and sale of food items and things like that? Yeah, um, we we did um, investigate that in our very first wave, and we've kind of come back to that issue of health safety measures in venues. What we learned the first time is that really it's it's all important to people. You know, our arts people tend to be voracious readers. They're absorbing a lot of information, but, but it of course differs. So my sense is to err on the side of comprehensiveness in terms of information about traffic flow, how it's gonna work, entry, how the distancing will be enforced, the mask wearing, and particularly enforcement. The, the weak point that we saw was basically people don't trust other audience members to follow the rules. And so they're concerned about enforcement. Um, but everything from ventilation, I think people wanna know about that. 
um, touchless transactions. You know, if, if, if there is testing being done at the door, most people will comply with that, but I don't know yet when that will be feasible. Um, so, so it's all important, but I think people will very much, you know, I'm kind of blown away, honestly, I get season announcements from some arts groups now and there's like no mention of COVID. And I'm like, what, what are they thinking? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I, cognizant of time, I wanna to get to another couple of questions here. Uh, this is from Carrie Hatcher at the Northrop. Mm. Um, are you aware of anyone on a national level coordinating public service announcements with getting vaccinated on behalf of the arts sector? Um, thank you, Carrie, for all you've done to make this happen in, in Minnesota and nationally. Um, the answer is, you know, is, is no. I, um, I've been working with a cohort of orchestras and I've really gotten some very strong pushback when I suggest they need to be involved in communicating about health, about vaccination or everything, they really feel that's not their role. And they have a partnership with the Cleveland Clinic or the Mayo Clinic. And, and you know, that's how they're sort of farming out all of that. But I actually think we need to find a voice where we feel comfortable communicating with our folks about health more generally and vaccination specifically. You know, we need to be aware there's serious reasons for hesitancy. People have legitimate concerns. There are good reasons why people don't wanna get vaccinated and we have to value that and listen to them while at the same time explain that if we don't reach herd immunity, we may never be able to come back. Um, and, and I think that's a difficult space, but we do education in our sector. We're really good at it. We're really good at opening up sensitive conversations. So I think we have to figure, we have to find that voice, Carrie. And I, I could think of no one better than Northrop to find that voice. Thank you so much, Alan. I think we are out of time. Can you put up that last slide again that has your website so people can uh, uh, sure. write that down? Absolutely. Um, if you want to stay in touch, go to audienceoutlookmonitor.com and on that homepage, um, if you scroll down, you can sign up for our email newsletter. And that's a great way to stay, uh, stay connected. Fantastic. Um, on behalf of Minnesota Citizens for the Arts, and, uh, and all of the arts organizations who are involved in the Minnesota cohort and everyone who's on the panel here today, thank you so much, Alan, for, for all this fantastic information. It's so much to, uh, to digest, but uh, we'll, we'll all be better for it. And for the attendees, I want to um, uh, thank everybody for being here. Thank everybody for participating in MCA's Arts Action Week. Uh, we still have meetings going on with legislators tomorrow. I hope you can be involved in that. And four o'clock tomorrow is our uh, Arts Action Week wrap up and happy hour. And most importantly, send off and thank you to our uh, fearless leader, Sheila Smith. I hope you can all join us. Um, and you will probably get a uh, link to that Zoom as well. Thank you all for being here um, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks.